get started. So welcome to another week of the Behavior, Evolution, and Culture Seminar Series. We have two more weeks left in the quarter. Uh, and um, I'll give you a little preview of what those talks will be. The uh, abstracts are up on our website at beck.ucla.edu. And um, next week we have Jennifer Smith coming um, from the, she's a postdoc at uh, the Center for Society and Genetics and the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology. And she is going to be talking about kinship structures, patterns of cooperation, and social network dynamics in the spotted hyena. So be sure to be here for that. And then we actually have one additional talk during finals week. Um, Christoph Bosch is going to be coming. So I hope you'll all be able to join us for that. And um, I'm pleased to have Perry Clark here from uh, the University of California at Davis. And he's going to be talking about infanticide and reproductive restraint in uh, the archetypical polygynous primate, who I believe is the baboon. Of course. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you very much for inviting me to give this talk. Um, um, in broad terms, I'm going to talk today about primate mating systems and the selection pressures acting on uh, the reproductive strategies within those systems. More specifically, I'm going to focus on the reproductive strategies of males. And my, uh, my, the objective of the talk, my, my aim is to present data uh, aim, uh, testing the validity of two competing hypothesis accounts of what it is, what are the ultimate objectives of, the, uh, of a male, a kind of an archetypal uh, reproductive male primate reproductive strategy is. And to do that, I'm going to use uh, models um, of uh, available models of how we, what am I trying to say, models of the way reproductive success should be distributed within groups. And so I'm, we find ourselves within the, the remit of reproductive skew theory. And so also it's important to say that because we're looking at the distribution of reproductive success uh, across males in the cohort, I'm thinking about multi-male species, multi-male, multi-female species. Species in which group, uh, within which there are groups where there are non-natal, uh, sexually active adult males competed for adult sexually receptive females. <coughs> okay, so we're, we're concerned about the distribution of reproductive success within groups, and we're talking about multi-male cohorts. As I'm sure you all know, then, we invariably find ourselves thinking about uh, uh, it, we're think, thinking about competition within the context of our dominance hierarchy. Uh, male primates, as in and many other species, compete for positions in a dominance hierarchy, and their rank within that hierarchy determines the, or the, the order in which they gain access to valuable resources, be it <coughs> food or be it sexually receptive females. And so we can, the, the kind, we can focus our question, we can, can, we, can, uh, we can tune our attention more specifically and ask the, what we're really talking about here, what I really want to... Uh, the question I really want to ask is what determines the, the extent of an alpha male or dominant male's reproductive monopoly? So here I'll just show you some data from a variety of species, all of which are catarines, and this just shows the proportion of infants sired by dominant males. And so as you can see, being a dominant male confers a great reproductive advantage, although, although there is enormous variance in the extent of that advantage. And so what I want to do is I want to gain some handle on why it is uh, that there is this variance. And I think more specifically what I, want to, uh, what I want to ask is, why isn't it the case that dominant males sire all of the kids? Why are the, uh, the reproductive monopoly of alpha males incomplete? <coughs> why do we see red on this graph? To date, uh, attempts to answer this question have relied on what I think we would all recognise and usefully term classical sexual selection. By classical sexual selection, I'm thinking about uh, the theory as initially conceived by Darwin and then fleshed out and validated, uh, well not validated, kind of built upon by the work of Bateman and uh, Trivers. <coughs> and really what, what I want to, I mean you're, as you'll probably guess and as I go through the talk you realise um, I think that this, this view, this classical view of sexual selection is a bit outdated and doesn't really hold water when you look at primate mating systems more typically. And so, uh, and what I think the, the kind of the, tr the, the reworking by Bateman and Trivers really has perpetuated this kind of Victorian model of male reproductive strategies, perpetuated this Darwinian view, the Darwinian male. And it's built on a, on a, on a couple of, there's a kind of a couple of key maxims that has always been used to, to substantiate the model. So things like Bateman's finding on his work in Drosophila that male reproductive success tends to increase linearly with mating. So if we imagine that there's little, little cost to mating for a male, then the sky's the limit. As long as a male keeps on mating, he'll keep on banging out kids. In contrast to females, of course. <coughs> male reproductive success is far more variable. 
uh, some males do really well, some males don't do very well. I mean, as I've just alluded to with my uh, previous graph. And so Bateman suggested that uh, males uh, were targeted very strongly by sexual selection and because, so he argued female reproductive success was relatively invariant, that it was probably, sexual selection was probably confined in the main to, act, to acting on males. Trivers then taking Bateman's work, uh, building on Bateman's work, then noted that the burden of parental investment tends to lie, uh, particularly, t uh, 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 most definitely in mammals, it relies on females, gestation, lactation, etc. And males are uh, essentially free from, uh, from the, the burden of parental investment. And as a consequence, they should really pursue their maximum potential reproductive output. They should, they should really attack this linear relationship between mating success and reproductive success. And all, and all these, various, uh, these uh, various conclusions, these various observations, we can really kind of boil them down into the essence of the Darwinian male, the essence of a kind of what I will variously call like a Darwinian male, a Trevensian perspective, whatever. We can really boil it down to say that the key prediction is, uh, especially from Triver's work on six roles, is that males should maximise the effort at the point of fertilisation and conception. That is, they should put everything they have into ensuring that they fertilise females. They're competing at the point of mating, at the point of conception or fertilisation. So that, this, uh, this view, this classical view of sexual selection, has been the prevailing model in the study of primate mating systems throughout its history, and indeed, I would argue, still pervades much of emerging theory today. And while maybe that's, you know, that you can be forgiven for uh, uh, kind of agreeing with this perspective if you look at the, uh, the primate order, Primates indeed have numerous kind of exemplars of sexual selection through intermale competition. So just to kind of illustrate this, we have some, so we have clear evidence of dimorphism on, in the top corner, so uh, selection for physical size, for, for body size in males. Females don't get as big because of the costs. <laughs> on the bottom corners we have uh, clear, there's lots of evidence of bounds for uh, selection for weaponry. Anyone who studied primates on the ground will tell you that males aren't afraid to use these and they use them with great effect. And so that, you know, this attests as some, some uh, selection for a, a competitive ability. And in the middle, we have uh, allude to the fact that while males trying to compete for maintaining exclusive mating association, it doesn't always pan out well. And so the competition for fertilization continues after the point of mating. And so obviously I'm invoking here the idea of sperm competition. So we have some nice chimpanzee testicles on the top. And the real crowd-pleasing photograph on the bottom is a chimpanzee brain in a guy's right hand and one chimpanzee testicle in the left hand. And so he's clearly, he's put a lot of thought into sperm competition. Okay, so returning to our graph <coughs> of the distribution of reproductive success, <coughs> dominance versus subordinates, and, and now recognising that uh, when people have looked at when people have uh, looked at this variance and looked at this in, the incomplete dominant male uh, reproductive monopoly, and they've adopted a classical view of sexual selection, we then ask ourselves why is there why is there why is there any red on this graph? Why are subordinates getting a look in? And the the standard conclusion has always been <coughs> that the, the fact that subordinates get a look in reflects the operation of constraints acting on the ability of dominant males to police subordinate mating. There are simply extraneous forces that prevent males from pursuing a total reproductive monopoly. And uh, more, this, this, uh, this was first suggested a long time ago in primatology, but more recently has become formalized within skew theory and is generally referred to as a, the kind of a compromised view of, of reproductive skew. That is, the assumption being that males want, all the reproductive, want to sire all the kids, but they're prevented from doing so by... Um, extraneous forces. And in, in primatology, it's more commonly kind of referred to as a limited control view. Uh, uh, that was a phrase put forward by Clutton Brock, and it seems to have taken hold within primatology. Okay, and <coughs> just as I think it's fair to say that there, it, it would be reasonable to assume, to agree with uh, <coughs> the Darwinian model of male reproductive strategies, given this clear evidence for Selection, sexual selection through intermale competition. Again, there's a lot of, uh, you, you could also be forgiven for uh, agreeing with this, the kind of the limited control model. So this, this, uh, this uh, it was first suggested that there were extraneous factors preventing complete reproductive monopolies in dominant males by, uh, 
I'm, I'm going to say Stuart Altman, Stuart Altman, I hope that's probably right, in the, the 60s with his work on rhesus macaques, and he, he put forward his now classic priority of access model. And the, the, kind of the, the, key, the key point in that model was that he noted that the receptive periods of female primates are invariably quite protracted in the order of days. And so to ensure uh, an exclusive mating association, males have to guard those females throughout that period. Sometimes only a few days, sometimes many days. <coughs> and as a consequence, simple stochasticity in female reproductive demography means that these, uh, these receptive periods can overlap. And uh, as a consequence, to ensure uh, it, uh, it's impractical for a, a dominant male to try and guard two females at once. He's, it's, it's, he's basically going to lose out if he tries to guard two at once. And so what he's forced to do when there's periods of overlap is to confine his attentions to one, only one female. Therefore, allowing subordinates, most Altman would argue in a, it would fall down the hierarchy. So allowing a, when there was two females overlapping, and then allowing the beta male to have a go. <coughs> and the key prediction was that the more overlap you observed within a species, uh, the lower the, the extent of the dominant male reproductive monopoly. And indeed, this is what you see. And so here I show you some data from a recent paper by Julia Osner showing a clear negative association between synchrony is a slightly misleading term here on the, uh, the x-axis. Uh, thinking more about oestrus overlap. There's not perfect synchrony, but there's just kind of varying degrees of proximity between the receptive periods of females. So this is on the x-axis on the y is the proportion of infants sired by an alpha male. And as you can see, there's a clear negative association. And indeed, not just uh, cross species does this, uh, you do see this effect. It's also, it's been shown time and time again in behavioral studies on the ground that you, there is this effect of oestrus overlap. So, there's, so I put it to you that there is clear evidence that dominant males are subject to constraints on their ability to police subordinate mating. Uh, Eastress overlap was not the only uh, constraint postulated. It's also been noted uh, that maybe a male number may uh, limit a, uh, a dominant male's ability to prevent subordinates from mating. The rationale here being that <coughs> uh, while there is a clear dominance hierarchy, while a dominant male is clearly uh, 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 higher, uh, uh, kind of dominant, while an alpha male is clearly dominant to a, a subordinate animal, subordinate animals still try, try and have a go. They still contest mating access. A low male numbers, this doesn't present much of a challenge for a dominant male, but as male numbers increase, and then concomitantly as the frequency of challenges increase, the, this in, in, in kind of inflicts an ever-increasing burden on dominant males. And on some at some point, so it's, so it's postulated, they are then forced to relinquish access because they can't tolerate the, the costs of challenge anymore. And so, again, they predict, it's predicted there should be a negative association between male number, challenger number, the frequency of contestation, and the extent of the alpha male monopoly. And indeed, <coughs> this is what you see. So again, a recent paper by Kutsukaki and Nunn showing exactly this with male number, competitor number along the X and the extent of the alpha male reproductive monopoly on the Y. And there is this negative association. Now, the, uh, the next thing to say is, unlike uh, the effects of oestrus overlap, which you can easily reproduce uh, on the ground in a behavioral study on the ground on a single population, the, this effect is not seen so uh, frequently uh, in kind of an on-the-ground behavioral context, whereas it, clear, does, it has a clear cross-species effect. That may or may not be a pertinent point. Okay? And the third and final uh, constraint that's often talked about is that of the energetic cost. So as I've said, female <coughs> primates, the receptivity in female primates is generally in the order of days. So males have to um, guard females for a protracted period. And a number of studies have now noted that the act of guarding uh, is very disruptive in terms of the allocation of activities within a male's activity budget. Most notably, what you find is that ma guarding males tend to forage less, they tend to move more, and they tend to rest less. And so the expectation is that they then experience a net reduction in energetic intake. And so then the prediction is there must come a point when the the, if a male is forced to guard too much, these energetic costs become intolerable, and then he's forced to relinquish access due to, the, due to a need to compensate for this loss during guarding. <coughs> and, that, and so I would argue that the, that the rationale is sound. That's the, that makes intuitive sense. And it's definitely the case that guarding does disrupt your activity budget. But uh, it has to be said it's circumstantial in the sense that no study has ever demonstrated 
a relationship between guarding duration, the ability of alpha males to monopolize access, and, a and, it, and, and the experience of a reduction in energetic intake during gardening. So it's just, it makes intuitive sense, but there's no actual direct uh, uh, evidence. <coughs> okay, so just to kind of a quick recap. So we see, that we see these incomplete reproductive monopolies by dominant males. And uh, we know that traditionally and indeed currently, people tend to, tend to try and account for this, uh, for, for this variance, for this lack of uh, complete monopoly using classical sexual selection. And they argue the fact that uh, males don't, uh, their dominant males don't sire all of the kids is because there are constraints acting upon their ability to police subordinate mating. And indeed, there is clear evidence that dominant males are subject to these constraints. So what's the problem? Well. I would argue, and others have argued as well, that it ignores a couple of key, uh, uh, it's, too, it's too generalized, it doesn't look at the, the kind of, the, the system on the ground. And so in particular, in the context of this talk, I'm going to argue that it ignores, most notably it ignores infant mortality, as I'll illustrate in a bit, <coughs> as I'll show you in a bit. There's a there's substantial infant mortality in uh, primate species, most notably as a result of infanticide. And <coughs> uh, a classical uh, kind of Trevensian view of sexual selection would say that males shouldn't necessarily worry about that. Parental care is the remit of the female. They can compensate for through infant mortality more efficiently by simply remating again. And that's not going to hold in a... Uh, that, uh, Hannah Coco and others argue that's not really going to hold simply because they're not going to encounter enough females to compensate for this loss of mortality. And so males should really be sensitive to the issue of offspring survivorship, the issue of infant mortality. Something that may be more specific to primate mating systems is that uh, is the fact that not all care can be provided by females. There are certain, there are certain there are certain forms of parental investment that a female is incapable of giving. This is in particular in the context of infanticide, as I'll again illustrate later. Females aren't really in a position to protect their infants from attack by males, because invariably males are substantially larger than them. And they really, they can't do much about it. If they're on their own, if it's one male versus one female, the male wins, without exception. <coughs> and then finally, given then, so the, the implication is that there's this constraint on female care, and so there's this need for some form of male investment, some form of uh, uh, paternal investment, then well, this then draws our attention to the fact that then adult mo male mortality becomes salient. The fact that if you are required to invest in your infants as, as an adult male, uh, you should then worry about the fact that if you're not always there, if you die, if mortality is high, this creates a bit of a problem for you. And the way, the way, the way I'm going with all of this is I'm, I'm, I'm suggesting that there, there is a, there's a reasonable argument, there's a reasonable uh, uh, it's reasonable to assume, given these constraints, <laughs> given these, these factors, that the, the, the pursuit of a total reproductive monopoly, as in contrast to what uh, a kind of a classical view of sexual selection would argue, there's a re there are reasons to believe that the pursuit of a total reproductive monopoly may not always be adaptive. Yeah, so classical sexual selection, wrong, is the, the kind of take-home message there. And uh, I'm going to illustrate all of this from this point on. I'm going to illustrate all of this through data from... Uh, Chak Mabuns, two troops of wild Chak Mabuns. And it kind of, unless I otherwise say, then it all, it all comes from one particular site <coughs> to work nature reserve, which is found in uh, South Africa. It's approximately 30 kilometers from Cape of Gullis, the most southerly point in uh, Africa. And that is noteworthy because uh, these, they, the, the baboons there experience very high seasonality. The high latitudes mean they experience very high seasonality. Excuse me in uh, uh, day length, which is something we're going to try and take advantage of later on. So two troops, and going to try and present as much of the data from them when the project started. The project, uh, the study was founded by my uh, PhD supervisors, uh, Dr. Uh, sorry, Professor Peter Hensey and Dr. Louise Barrett, Professor Louise Barrett, sorry. And uh, <coughs> yeah, so this is where the data comes from, just kind of setting the scene, contextualizing it all. And also just, yeah, Papua, uh, I suppose I should also, I'm sure most of you know, but there are five generally recognized species, subspecies of baboon. Chak baboon is the most, uh, the most southerly, and is the most southerly savanna baboon, which is what people normally think about if they kind of imagine a baboon. By which I mean a multi-male, multi-female species hanging around eating stuff on the ground. Okay, <coughs> so 
I kind of I'm setting up my argument. I'm setting the scene for what I believe to be the uh, uh, a possible counter uh, counter model to that of a kind of classical sexual selection, Trevensian sexual selection. And so maybe uh, I'm, you know I feel I feel it's important that I, I point out that baboons are a very very good model of uh, sexual selection, uh, classical sexual selection. So if I find any deviation from a, a, from a, the the classical model. I'd, I, I want it to be known that this is not a consequence of me studying some idiosyncratic species. Baboons are exemplars uh, of sexual selection through intermale competition. So we illustrate this here with males are generally about 1.9 to 2 times the size of a female, very, very much larger. And uh, again, there's, clear, uh, there's a lot of uh, clear sexual selection for weaponry. Indeed, I, I don't know. I, I've always meant to confirm this, I've given this talk before and I always say this and I always wanted to confirm it, but I think the Papanines are the only uh, uh, species, are the only um, uh, group that have, uh, they have these dental adaptations on their lower jaw that allow their canine to grow back and form a kind of a whetstone, a honing facet that allows them to sharpen their teeth. And so when you hear male baboons fighting, you often hear them grinding their jaw and they're sharpening their teeth and their, sheep, their teeth are very, very sharp and inflict very, very serious damage upon each other. And so they are important. And they are important because what you find is this is like a very kind of loose photographic correlation. But what you often find is that good canine quality, good physical condition is also associated with the attainment of higher rank. As your, as your, as your canines deteriorate, as your physical condition deteriorates, so does your rank. And so you've got to be in good nick to be an alpha male. And you want to be an alpha male because you'll sire most of the kids. You'll sire anywhere between 60 and 80% of the kids. So you want to have all the weaponry you can, and you want to be well equipped. So I put it to you that baboons, I think Shrivers would have, um, well, I, I don't know, but I'm sure he'd imagine that that was a good illustration of what he had in mind when he was thinking of the Darwinian male. <coughs> OK, well, as I pointed out earlier, I think one of the things uh, classical sexual selection overlooks is this issue of infant mortality. And this is, this, uh, and this is why baboons are also a good, uh, a good kind of a species to examine the, the I answer the questions I want to, to ask questions I want to answer <coughs> because in, uh, infant mortality is very high and in particular rates of infanticide are very very high in chakra wounds some of the highest within the order generally so I just illustrate this here with some data from a paper by Peter and Louise back in the day showing the proportion of infants born that die as a consequence of infanticide across four populations of uh, chakra wound as you can see anywhere between 12 to 15 percent generally get whacked I think it's also, uh, I should also point out that infanticide in uh, non-human primates, uh, in, yeah, non-human primates in some calashishis basically is always by males. And it's, the idea here is a sexually selected strategy whereby by killing a, a female's infant, uh, they, they hasten their return to estrus because they cut off, they, they stop lactational amenorrhea, therefore increase the rate at which they encounter sexually receptive females. And it's a very big deal in, um, in baboons. And this is a slightly gruesome picture demonstrating that it does actually happen. <coughs> okay, as I also alluded to, there are, there are constraints on female care. The, the fact of the matter is that the uh, enormous dimorphism in, in body size means that females really can't do very much about infanticide. If it's just them versus a male, they're not going to do very well. And so the, the point being that Given this, then, you expect that males really need uh, to pay some attention to the risks of infanticide. And indeed, you see, you see that uh, uh, chak maboons have, they form what, various, what is often called these friendships with females, and they are seen to actively intervene in attacks on their infants, their putative infants. And, uh, <coughs> sorry. And are able to increase offspring survivorship as a consequence. So, <coughs> I put it to you uh, that males are, male investment in female, uh, in offspring survivorship is necessary in baboons. And m males should care about it. They're not in a position to compensate through infant mortality through remating. And uh, the mothers of these infants can't do anything about it. So males should pay attention and males do pay attention. Okay, well then... Uh, Given that males are involved in the, the survival of their infants in the care, care in a kind of a loose sense in this kind of relatively infrequent care they provide, because infanticide is a relatively infrequent behavior, <coughs> it's then interesting to note that in, in, in chakma baboons, uh, and not just in our study site, a number of studies have now shown this, show that uh, it's often the case that 
previously, recently usurped alpha males. Those males who sired most of the kids, who have sired most of the kids, are now in the group as we speak, at the same time as when an infanticidal male will come in and not only try and kill kids, but also try and seek the top spot. Those males are often actually absent during their infant's period of vulnerability. So here I show you residency curve, uh, residency curve within a group of recently usurped alpha males relative to infant age. We basically, the first 12 months of the period you really want to worry about if you're an infant. And as you can see, uh, many infants are born with, uh, about 25% of infants are born with that, they're kind of the, the most likely sire absent, the past alpha male absent, and this can go up to nearly 50% if you go, kind of, as infants grow older, seven to eight years old. And so, <coughs> so what I'm kind of leading up to here is to say that males are necessary to ensure the survivorship of their offspring, but they're not always in a position to do so. They are often absent from the group. Now, this isn't always the case in mortality, but it is. Sometimes they sustain a wound, disappear, and you sometimes find males come back after a, a quite a long time. But nevertheless, there is, there, is this, there is this deficit in care. I put it to you that there's a deficit in care due to this post-usurption absence of, 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 of previously alpha males. And so this is all building up to uh, uh, what, I, what, what kind of class, what reproductive skew theory would call a concession model of uh, male reproductive strategies. That is, <coughs> And, the, and what, I, what I'm, I've slightly gone about that ask about face. Um, so my hypothesis is alpha males should concede conceptions to encourage subordinate redundancy and increase, in turn, increase the chances of additional protection. And the reason I hypothesise this is because we know that in in female chakmah beings, the solution to this absence of males is to try and, uh, and predispose other males to protect their infants. They uh, they try and pursue a polyandrous strategy polyandrous within a single cycle, and they try and get multiple males inclined to protect their infants. And we illustrate this with this wonderful photograph. It may not be very clear, but there's one male uh, who's like a, a slightly royal anchor male, carrot, surrounded by like seven females with kids. And this was like during a time when a nasty male was in the group, and he's, he's probably thinking, my God, what am I doing here? <laughs> and so uh, the hypothesis is that maybe alpha males Maybe they, alpha males could in some way facilitate this female counter strategy. Maybe they could play off this female solution to their absence and benefit from it as well. And so they, they, could, they, could, allow, they could increase its efficacy. And so the reason we talk about subordinate residency, the, 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 the classic prediction of a, a, a concession model of reproductive skew is that you, as an alpha male, as a dominant male, you have to provide some incentive to subordinates to, and to, to encourage them to play the game, to play the strategy you're trying to play out. And so, <coughs> but you only need to do so, you only need to provide a, a staying incentive, an incentive for subordinate participation if they are, um, if they are uh, inclined to leave the group at any time. And the uh, nice thing about Chakma, what's gone wrong there, is that you do find that subordinate residency is, uh, is relatively, uh, I want to say flitty, that's not the word, I kind of want to, Subordinate males tend to move between groups on a very short-term basis. Their residency is quite um, stochastic, short-term. And what you find is that in our uh, study site, that males, subordinate males will move in, turn in, in response to short-term changes in the availability of receptive females in other groups. And so their residency within the focal group is relatively unpredictable. And so if you're, and I illustrate this here just quickly with a graph showing uh, on the, on the x-axis we have excess male number. That is the number of adult males over and above the number of sexually receptive females within the group. So when, there are, when, the, when excess males are positive, there's more males than there are sexually receptive females. When it's negative, there are less uh, males than there are sexually receptive females. And on the Y, we have the change in the following months in the size of the male cohort in response to, to, this num the, to, the, to the number of excess males in the previous month. What, can you, what you can see is that when there are, when there are less uh, males in the group than there are sexually receptive females, ten, males tend to immigrate into the group. When there are more, males tend to emigrate. And so there's this, <coughs> and so from, the, from a dominant male's uh, perspective, there's a need to stabilize these subordinate movements. So there's a need to discourage these short-term movements between groups by subordinate males if they, are, if they want them to be involved in the kind of the care of their infants. Okay, so all of this is building up to, so what I've been building up saying is that I, I put it to you that uh, uh, 
a classical view of sexual selection, this pursuit, unrelenting pursuit of fertilization success is unrealistic given what we know about uh, infant mortality, subordinate residency, and the need for paternal investment in infants. And I put it to you that, that males may be able to benefit from, uh, from not, pursue, not uh, ruthlessly pursuing a total monopoly and conceding some paternity subordinates in, in, in an effort to encourage them to remain in the group and then participate in the care by virtue of the female reproductive strategy. So, <laughs> so the first prediction, the key prediction, that is in contrast to classical sexual selection, I, uh, it, it should be the case that subordinate reproductive success within groups uh, is a function of more than, uh, than more than these constraints on their ability to police subordinate mating, more than these extraneous, uh, these extraneous forces. Importantly, secondly, it must be the case that subordinate residency is uh, mediated by past reproductive success. It must be the case that if, uh, if a subordinate male experiences reproductive success, he must, be he must be more inclined to stay in the group than would have otherwise been the case. This obviously is uh, obviously important because there's no point ceding paternity if it has no bearing on the residency decisions of a subordinate male. And finally, uh, the presence of subordinates must be associated with some reduction in the risk of infanticide. Uh, this is, that last one's quite hand wavy, and I always feel a bit uncomfortable when we talk about this one, but I'll do the hand waving when we get there. So the first question, going back to this idea that dominant males are subject to constraints on their ability to police subordinate mating, going back to the, the most commonly cited cause of this oestrus overlap. If it's, if it's all about oestrus overlap, then it should be the case that all of those conceptions that accrue to subordinates occurred at time when there was overlap between the receptive periods of females. So here we... Here we see the number of infants sired by alpha males and subordinate males uh, for this for the period of interest. So this is based on paternity analysis? No, this is not molecular, this is all behavioural. So this is about consortships or something? Yeah, but consortships and chakra are in the order of seven to eight days. Yeah. So I mean it's quite a good it's quite a good in fact there's recent work showing it is a good proxy for um, so it should be the case that uh, if it's all about oestrus overlap, then these should all occur during times of, uh, of overlap. And what, <coughs> what you see is that only eight of these occurred during periods when the receptive periods of females overlapped. And indeed, uh, on the ground it was observed that uh, the vast majority of these were actually uncontested. A dominant male did, made no attempt to contest access to these females. They just stood by and watched. So there's something else is going on here. We can't explain away the success of subordinates simply by invoking oestrus overlap. Okay, well maybe then it's this issue of competitive pressure. Maybe just these conceptions accrued at times of high male number. So here I show you uh, uh, the number of male number across the, the x-axis and the duration of alpha guarding bouts, the ability of a dominant male to sustain an exclusive mating association with a female. And what you can see is there's no real relationship. That is. If, if it were about uh, limited control, it should be the case that there'd be a negative association between the duration of an alpha guarding bout and the number of competitors within the group. But there is no such relationship. <coughs> we can make a more kind of, take a more nuanced look at this, a more uh, finesse look, and we can uh, get some measure of the actual intensity of competition, not just kind of a, a crude uh, competitor number measure. So we look at the operational sex ratio, the number of the number of uh, sexually mature males, the number of sexually receptive females, and again looking at this, uh, the, its effects on the duration of alpha guarding. And what you see is, uh, you, again, you'd expect a negative relationship if, if it were about limited control, but again, you don't see any such association. So I put it to you that there is no effect of competitor pressure on the ability of dominant males to maintain exclusive mating associations. What's the unit on the x y axis? Sorry, say again? What are the units on the y axis? Days yeah. Consecutive. Yeah. They don't mess around, our boys. When they want to guard a female, they really get stuck in. Okay, and so then, maybe a better way to look at this is the probability of subordinates actually gaining conception relative to male number. And the expectation here again is that the more challenges, the more males are in a group, it should be the case, the more likely the subordinate is to, uh, to conceive an infant, is to sire an infant. So we have the probability of conception on, on, on the Y, male number on the X. And again, you can see there's no association. Indeed, most of the uh, conceptions seem to accrue to subordinates during periods of low male number. What's, um, I don't understand the units in the project. 
So the problem, but sorry, gone. So the number two male has a twenty-five percent chance of. The, no, so this is the size of the male cohort at the time when a conception of two males then have a one in four chance of getting a kid. So one out they so so subordinates, all subordinates or okay, so the two subordinates is two males, so they've one is the alpha male? Yeah, so this is so this is, is a one in four chance, so on, on four occasions, let's say, there are there were there infants were sired when there were two males in the group. On one of those occasions, a subordinate did well. Is, it, is the alpha male, the alpha male obviously, and then every other male is subordinate? How are you well, this is the way I'm conceiving it here. This is, yeah, I mean, no, I think it, that's, a, that's a good point. I mean, it's definitely the case that there are beta males and, and, and gamma males, but just for the for kind of the sake of, uh, I don't know, kind of crispness in the argument, I'd just make this dichotomous distinction. But no, you're, you're absolutely right. <coughs> so, so the point is that if, if, if we're about the effects of competitive pressure, there should, be a, there should be a positive association between the probability of subordinate conception and the, and the, and the relation with male number. And indeed, you in fact see that most of these conceptions uh, accrue to subordinate during periods of low number, which in, if you were thinking about concession, you were thinking about your desire to stabilize a male cohort. This is, of course, when you'd expect conceptions to accrue to subordinate. Because this is when you want to prevent subordinates from leaving. So this, uh, not only is it contrary to the expectations of the classical view of sexual selection, but in fact lends quite good support to a, a concession model. Yeah? It seems like what might matter more, though, here is the male-female ratio rather than the absolute number. Do you have uh, No, you're absolutely right. No, I, I, I don't have for this one. I mean, that was, that was the kind of my, my objective for doing that. Okay. No, I mean, you're, you're definitely right. I could, I could probably generate it if I'd, I, I, I clearly just didn't think enough about it. So, uh, maybe I should wait. I should wait, probably. I've got a question about this one. I'll wait. I can bore you to tears later on <laughs> if you like. I can't wait. I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> I love her. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the point is so there are these two, there are these three uh, constraints on a dominant male uh, mating. Eustress overlap doesn't account for what we see on this, in, this, in, this, in these baboons here, nor does uh, limit to con uh, the competitive pressure. So then we turn to the last uh, commonly, <coughs> how am I doing for time? The last, um, the last commonly invoked constraint, that of the energetic constraint. Now, <coughs> I want to preface this by saying it's really, really hard to do this in any kind of systematic way. You can't you can't, in any rigorous quantitative way, measure the calorific intake of a wild baboon. It'll get extremely annoyed if you start tampering with its food. And <laughs> so you can only really, you have to do all of these things indirectly. And so I, I openly admit that this is going to be a little bit hand wavy, so just, you can insult me all you like, but I, I know it's coming. So just to remind you of the argument, the argument is that uh, guarding constraints uh, uh, disrupts the male activity budgets, in particular it reduces the amount they feed, the, uh, the, uh, the amount they rest, and it increases the amount they move. So the, the expectation is they experience a net reduction energetic intake. <coughs> okay, so and I also said to you that uh, all the data I'm presenting to you comes from a troop of wounds found at very, very high latitudes. They experience very, very uh, big seasonal differences in day lengths. Now this is notable because it's well established that seasonality and day length also has a profound consequence on the, ability, the profound implications for the allocation of activities within an activity budget. Specifically, you find that during, day, during periods of short day length, animals are forced to really focus on their feeding and forced to focus on energetic intake. But during periods of longer day, obviously they can take it a little more easily. So <coughs> we thought about this and we thought, well, okay, uh, let's imagine that animals, males are subject to some form of energetic cost when guarding. Then, given that we know at this study site that there is this, uh, there's also a seasonal effect on the allocation of activities irrespective of guarding, then maybe it should be the case that there should be seasonality in, uh, uh, seasonality in, in the probability that a subordinate gains a conception if this reflects some underlying energetic burden. <coughs> okay? So, well, so the first thing to do is just to see what we, what we can see in terms of the allocation of activities across seasons. Winter here is, so we're talking like 10, 11 days, uh, 
10, 11, 12, let's say, and then in summer we're talking like 14, 15 days, and so they're substantially longer. And these are the, the, the three key activities. Uh, again, blue is non-guarding, red is guarding across winter and summer, and you can see that um, that um, there is there is some see, there is some uh, difference across seasons in the in the allocation of activities with a guarding and non-guarding male. But I'm not I'm not actually going to be very excited by this difference. This is not what I'm going to rely on to when I kind of give my my money shot. But there is there is some sense of which there is males are subject to uh, uh, greater uh, costs when, in, when guarding in winter. They seem to rest far less and they seem to move far more. So, com compared to summer seasons. <coughs> and so, given this, then maybe if there is some form of energetic cost, maybe there should be seasonality in the probability of subordinates gaining a conception. And so this is, uh, on, on the left, we have the duration. So going back to this idea of the ability of a dominant male to maintain an exclusive mating association, we have the duration of alpha guarding on, on, the, on the Y here on, and on the left-hand graph and versus winter versus summer. And there's no difference across seasons. You can see that. Again, then, the probability that a subordinate gets a look in in winter <laughs> versus summer, again, there's absolutely no difference. And so... <laughs> and when I said I wasn't, I'm not necessarily that worried about if there is a seasonality in the costs of guarding for males. The fact of the matter is there's no, there's no apparent evidence of any energetic cost acting on on a dominant males, irrespective of, uh, irrespective of seasonality. So, my slightly kind of my my vague attempt to get at what it is the energetic burden of guarding may or may not be very robust. But the fact is there is no evidence uh, that uh, the that the um, reproductive monopolies vary in relation to possible underlying costs. <coughs> okay, so the second prediction was that uh, for a concessionary strategy to work, it must be the case that uh, a, a seeding paternity, seeding reproductive opportunities to subordinates, inclines them to, re to uh, stay in the group longer than would have otherwise been the case. So here I show you the residency curves of, we call them fathers, and so those males that have benefited from, con from concession, or what, we, what we're, I'm, I'm calling concession, and those that did not. And so the first thing to note is that males that experience reproductive success, subordinates that experience reproductive success, tend to stay longer, duration of residency along the X, stay, tend to stay longer within the group than males that don't uh, experience any reproductive success. Now, of course, it could be argued that this is simply the case that if you stay longer in a group, you experience more reproductive success. Okay, so the, the red dots illustrate when these conceptions uh, accrue to subordinates, and you can see most of them happened fairly early on in their residency. So this, to me, this suggests that it is past reproductive success that mediates the residency decisions of subordinate males. And this is crucial to the efficacy of a concessionary strategy. Uh, well, so, good question. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say I don't know. I mean, I could easily find out. Uh, no, I mean, I'm, I, uh, so in terms of rank, I'm doing this blanket dichotomy. So in terms of age, yeah, I mean, you're right. I mean, I guess what you're getting at is that maybe the, if they were older, they'd be less inclined to leave. Is that where you're... Well, I think, yeah, well, I think the one important thing, and I think it, it would be important to concede, is that a subordinate is anyone who didn't get to be alpha. Now, and as I'm sure you know, that if a male comes into groups and tries to get the alpha spot, he doesn't get it, and he's still in good nick and he's young, he may well leave. And so that may well exactly. inflate the effect. Yeah, no, I mean, I think, that, I think that's a fair comment, definitely. It's a lovely graph. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, say again? Do individual differences in fitness in subordinate males predict individual differences in residency? What, what do you mean by fitness? You mean the so reproductive... So having achieved, uh, you know, producing offspring. Yeah. Are they, are they then... Are those, they those subordinate males that do get, uh, they, tend to, they tend to stay longer. Yeah, that's... That's what this, this that's, 
Yeah. And importantly, they experience reproductive success early on, but they're then incl inclined to stay longer, irrespective of the fact they don't get anything during that protracted period of subsequent residency. What's the sample size of the subordinate Well, I guess it's, it's going to be, it's, yeah, well, it's 23 is the number of conceptions. Uh, and oh, you mean in terms of support, actual male number? I don't, uh, to be honest, I don't know. I could easily, I can find that out if you'd like. Hello. Oh, so the more you have, the longer you stay. Oh, okay, I see what you mean. I see. Okay, I see what you mean. Well, I, no, good question. This is averaged across all subordinates, so I can't. It does. I. That's a good question. I, again, I could easily. I could. I could find out. But again, I'm just trying to do this, trying to get this argument crisp with this distinction between dominance and subordinates. Definitely, no, definitely. I mean, the, the only obvious problem is that uh, there's not many conceptions floating around to subordinates. So we're talking about 23. So sample size, well, you'll bang your head against sample lots size quite zeros. quickly. You have lots of zeros. Well, for the non-fathers, yeah. So that's what we're... Well, I, I, thought, I thought the question was that... So one subordinate has one kid and one subordinate has three kids. Does the subordinate has three kids stay longer than the one that has one? Yes. Yeah. I don't know. Okay, uh, so the final thing is that uh, this seeding of paternity should reduce uh, the risk of infanticide. It should, it, should it should augment offspring survivorship. Now, I said earlier on that it was all a bit hand-wavy, and this is hand-wavy simply because infanticide doesn't happen very often. People, it, it's invoked to this, this kind of monumental overarching selection pressure in primate mating system, but it's very, very rare, and I, I'm not trying to... I'm not trying to diminish its salience, but it's just, it's quite, a, it's quite a hard thing to get a handle on in terms of sample size. You'd have to, you know, you'd have to really hang around and watch the monkeys for a while. <coughs> but anyway, so given that, given that kind of apology, let me say that during uh, the, the period of interest here, uh, there were 26 periods of influx. By influx, I mean in, uh, immigration by uh, a male inclined to commit infanticide. Again, we're talking here about basically young prime conditioned males, all of their teeth in good condition, who are also going to vie for the alpha uh, spot. <coughs> this, uh, this approximates to about one influx per period of vulnerability, the v vulnerability of an infant, uh, uh, an infant's vulnerable period. <coughs> During this period of inf uh, influx, um, I've lost my train of thought. During these periods of influx, infants of alpha males, those infants uh, sired by the alpha male pre prior to his usurpation, uh, uh, during these influxes, on our, uh, the probability of an infant being without a primary protector, being out with the most likely sire, the, 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 the alpha male essentially, the most likely sire was around 0.36, quite high. This probability, if you then, so the way I've set up this argument would suggest that male, dominant males benefit from the female attempts to secure multiple males, to, uh, to kind of get additional backup protection, what we'll call surrogate protectors here. And you find that if you, then, if you then consider their presence, their residency, you find that uh, infants were vulnerable only in kind of one in five times. And then <coughs> if you consider these simultaneously, you see that an infant uh, is relatively rare for an infant to be without a, a, a protector. Now, this is where the hand waving gets really vigorous. So if there are five actual observed uh, infanticides within, during these 26 influxes, Two occurred when uh, there was neither a primary protector, the most likely sire, and a, and a secondary, a surrogate protector. Uh, two occurred, uh, sorry, two occurred when these, both of these individuals were absent. Uh, two occurred when there was no surrogate and the alpha male was there and, and in a position to do his job. He clearly didn't do his job very well. And uh, there was one when surrogate and primary were there, but the mother wasn't there. And so I've told you that mothers kind of, uh, don't help at all, but you kind of got to have one, you know, nevertheless. Okay, so there's some suggestion. Again, I, I'm kind of apologizing frantically for this data, but there's some suggestion that there is a, there, it, 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 the, by conceding paternity and augmenting the female solution to the problem of infanticide, there is this reduction in, uh, in, in infant mortality, possibly. You need a lot more data to say anything with any kind of certainty. My God, like a frenzy of hands. <laughs> 
So this is anywhere between zero and 12 <coughs> months. Were there no infanticides of infants of non-alpha males, subordinate males? Uh, possibly. This, I've only confined my interest uh, to here. But you know which ones are the infants of the alphas and which Yeah, based, I mean, based on this, on, on, the, on, this behavioral, on, on this behavioral measure. Yeah. I'll save my question to let, because it's a more substantive question. It's not just a clarifying question, so I, I can... I can okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, so just quick, um, just a quick recap. So, <coughs> the, 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 the way I set up this talk uh, and the way I set up the data is an, an attempt to... Uh, it's, it's kind of a roundabout route. What I, my objective was to say that I believe there is a counter model to the classical view of sexual selection. And my, my, my way to substantiate what I believe is my counter model, were, and the, 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 the main way I've done this is to try and discredit the classical view. And so to summarize, we find that oestrus overlap does account for uh, some uh, subordinate reproductive success, uh, but not all. So there's something missing. Male competitive pressure, male number, operational sex ratio, however you want to frame it, doesn't get you anywhere close. <coughs> uh, alpha male guarding, uh, I mean, again, I'm going to do hand waving. Alpha, there's no suggestion. I don't, I, don't, I don't think there's any substance to the claim that energetic costs are mediating uh, alpha male uh, monopolies, the, uh, the ability of alpha males to maintain exclusive mating associations. And it is certainly the case uh, that subordinate residency is sensitive to reproductive success and, importantly, sensitive to past reproductive success. They're not lingering in the expectation of more. They're, they're lingering because they've already had some. Uh, <coughs> and there is some suggestion that, that this, this approach, this voluntary seeding of paternity, has, has some benefit in terms of reduction in infant mortality. And so the take-home message, the implication is, so I think I, I want to say that contrary to a kind of Trevensian view of sexual selection of Darwinian, the kind of Darwinian male, male uh, reproductive strategies <coughs> do seem to be sensitive to the need to maximize the number of reproductively viable offspring rather than just trying to fertilize kids all the way, all the way down the line, trying to get fertilizations. You want to actually get those kids reproducing. And I never... I have mixed things when I say this, so I don't know if this is like a peculiarly English phrase, but uh, males are hoist by their own petard. So what goes around comes around. So an alpha male is a male who came in, whacked some kids, and then gained the alpha status. And then he's there worrying about the next male who's going to come along and whack his kids. And so you know, he's kind of a victim of his own intent. And then <coughs> why do we care? Well, I, I would argue that a lot of prevailing theory, particularly in primatology, I'm thinking now, a lot of recent work on this idea of intersex uh, on intersexual conflict and the, and the idea that males and females should always be at loggerheads about the solution to infanticide, particularly this idea of polyandry, <coughs> relies very heavily on, on this kind of old school view of sexual selection. And, and in addition, I would say that and, uh, related to this, this uh, there's the prevailing model of oestrus advertisement, here I'm thinking about the graded signal hypothesis, this relies very explicitly on, on a classical view of sexual selection. And I think Given what, we, what, I, uh, what, I, uh, what I now know about uh, what baboons are up to, the archetypal polygynous primate, I suggest that we need to go back and think a little harder about what these, what these models and theories are saying. And so I just thank these people. Also, I realized I left Richard off. Some of you, I'm sure, know Richard McElreath. He's my mentor and generally good guy. And also... <coughs> I want to close by saying that, that all this talk about infanticide uh, always talks about males and females. And it's always about the male solution, the female solution. And so I, I present you with this extremely alarming looking man who uh, <laughs> some would argue was like, could be like the godfather of primatology. He's certainly the godfather of uh, field studies and baboons. He is Eugene Morea. Oh, well, I've already told you that. Uh, he is an, a, an excellent character on many, many levels, but he had a great love of, uh, as like many South Africans, he had a great love of the felt, and he studied baboons a lot and wrote a number of books on it. But he, he said in one of these books that it's a wise baboon that knows its father. And what I'm trying to get across here is that 
we always imagine that infants are passive vessels in, in, in this system. So males are running around holding the infant, and females are running around, everyone's trying to whack the kid. But it's ultimately the, the, the kid that is, you know, the, is the, the kind of the, the, the strongest target of selection. So there must be, there is some solution that may be invoked by an infant as well. So maybe one, we should have turned our attentions to, to that now. And that is me boring you now. Over. <laughs>